It's one of the civil rights challenges of the 21st century. Digital technology has made it easier to track our personal information than ever before. Everything from our likes and dislikes to where we are at a given moment and who we talk to. In 2013, Edward Snowden leaked documents from the NSA, revealing just how much of this personal information ends up in the hands of state surveillance programs. I want to know what this means for our personal privacy. I'll explore how hackers and activists are working to curb the increasing surveillance trend. Our personal data is valuable, but how far are we really willing to go to protect it? How often do we take a real interest in seeing where it ends up? Professor Jonathan Obar set up a fake networking site called NameDrop with some outrageous terms of service. He wanted to see how many people would take notice. This is the front page of the site. It looks pretty, pretty familiar. Now you can sign up right away by clicking this first button here and you agree to the name drop privacy policies. Or you can click here to read the privacy policy, sort of emulating this experience of joining a social network for the first time. Which option did most users choose? 74% chose the quick join option, which means that they agreed to it without even reading the privacy policy. Can you tell me what some of the crazier clauses were in your study? One of the clauses that we put in dealt with data sharing. So the clause said essentially any data that you share will be shared or could be shared with the NSA. And there was a, a more explicit gotcha clause in there too, wasn't there? We included what we call a child assignment clause, which essentially said uh, by agreeing to these terms of service, you agree as a form of payment to give up your firstborn child which is creepy, of course. We want it to be creepy and to go to the extreme, but if you're willing to give up your firstborn and miss such a clause, uh, you know, what else are you missing that's not as serious? Did anyone actually click that they do not agree with the service? 100% of the people that took the survey clicked agree to both the privacy policy and the terms of service policy. That's telling. <laughs> it would take users at least 40 minutes a day, and that's every day, to read all of the policies that you would need to read to provide informed consent to all the services and all the apps and everything that we engage with all the time online. And that's just not realistic. What's at stake for users if they don't read these agreements? As one participant said, there, it's a cultural norm to ignore policies. And that's a problem, which suggests that this particular tool isn't working. It's not providing privacy protections. It's not providing digital reputation protections. So we need something better. NameDrop's terms of service may be fictional, but the truth is that most people have no idea and don't seem to care what they're signing off on. That's a real problem, because in today's world, your data can be used to manipulate you in terrifying new ways, whether by a political party trying to get your vote or that online advertisement that won't stop following you around. Cybersecurity expert Eric Perrant does deep web investigations on behalf of corporations and law enforcement, and increasingly, the tools he uses are publicly available meaning pretty much anyone could be using these tools to dig into your past. I'm going to show you a couple of tools that are actually out there that anybody can use. And when you put in something, a search parameter, so if I put in your name, for example, we've already got some hits here for uh, different company names or locations. And uh, you can actually navigate through the data, but uh, there's a visualization, which is very interesting. Uh, because when you look at it here, what you're actually seeing is the pertinence of these different subjects. So when you click on these things, it'll actually show you the links that it found that uh, pertain to that particular subject. They keep track of everything you've searched for since the beginning of time, basically. You see people posting stuff, sometimes you say, well, that's stupid. You should never have posted that because it's gone now. It's out of your control. So where do you see that going? To hell. <laughs> I mean, let's, fa let's face it, these corporations have all your data. They know exactly what you've searched for. And uh, from a privacy perspective, it's a huge problem. What's scary is that Perrant is just scratching the surface of where our data ends up once we've signed it away. I visited Dr. Ann Kavukian at the Privacy and Big Data Institute to learn about just how massive a challenge getting control over our data will be, especially when so many different groups are after it. The Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. did a study last year. They looked at 12 mobile health and fitness apps, and they found that the 12 devices they looked at, the information was flowing to 76 different third parties, unauthorized. 76, that's just one. I tell companies, look, you may collect information from individuals, and you may have custody and control over that information, but you don't own that information. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the data subject to whom the information relates. I cannot tell you how different things have been since Edward Snowden's revelations, because he 
really revealed for the first time the massive amount of government surveillance taking place all around the world. Public distrust is at an all-time high. 90% of people were very concerned about their privacy, didn't know what to do about it. With so much pressure, there's no surprise that most people feel stuck when it comes to protecting their privacy online. Some members of the global hacking community are trying to pave a way forward. While the community doesn't always see eye to eye on how to protect personal data, almost all agree that it's something worth fighting for. David Mirza Ahmad is a former black hat hacker who's built an operating system to do just that. So you and your colleagues are developing an operating system that's designed to enhance people's privacy and give them more security. There's a spectrum of privacy preserving technologies that you can use. In our project, we try to bring them together. Everything in Subgraph OS today goes out through the Tor network. And we have secure file sharing tools and secure email tools. And we have a secure chat tool. Your background is in the black hat world. Now you're on the open source side of things. Do you think that's a, a trend uh, that we're going to see happen as well? The hacking subculture, it's not about you know crime. It's like just about understanding how things work and you know challenging arbitrary authority. There are places where governments are extremely aggressively monitoring for any kind of dissent. And privacy is like a question of life or death in some of these places. So I think a lot of people from our generation and, and, and the generation that's there now is, is continuing to be at the front of this movement to make sure that the internet remains an open, free, transparent uh, platform. Thousands of hackers and activists around the world are pushing the limits when it comes to defending privacy and fighting back against surveillance. In many cases, they do so at extreme risk to their own personal freedom. In 2015, Canada passed sweeping surveillance laws as part of its new anti-terror legislation, Bill C-51. In response, hacktivists from Anonymous fired back with targeted operations against the Canadian political and security establishment. I connected with Anonymous hacktivist Raymond Johansson to get an idea of how these operations work and why people risk so much to take part. Last year, in protest of a Canadian bill, C-51, a number of hacktivists took down the website of the Prime Minister of Canada and also the Canada's spy agency. Can you take us through how something like that would, uh, would go down? Of course, my answer is going to be hypothetical and I'm not on camera going to say anything uh, to make uh, things easier for CSIS. It works like this. A few people start to notice that something is going on Let's say they read about the Patriot Act uh, being imported to Canada in the form of a, of a bill. Maybe it's called C-51. They get worried. Enough people start to do research and see that this is going to be wrong. Then they start to spread information. More people joins in and some of them may start to work on attacking servers and then maybe attempt a little hack and get a couple of documents out showing uh, how badly the CSIS have acted in the past. Were there international hackers involved in the uh, in the DDoSs of the Canadian government websites? I can definitely say yes, but I say that as having watched it from the outside. Regularly, I participate in, in swap meets where we uh, exchange tasks. So a Mexican will do something that needs to be done in Sweden, and the Swedes, in their turn, will do something that needs to be done in Thailand. And it's just a smart way, an obvious way to, to protect uh, everybody. Do you ever fear that the work that you do could get you into a lot of trouble? I work with those persecuted and jailed panels, activists and hacktivists around the world, so I know what could potentially happen to me. But you see, uh, I have no sense of self-importance. I am no one, I am irrelevant. But, of course, as all activists with boots on the ground or um, in front of a keyboard, I accept the risk. So what do you say to people who, who, who claim that they don't have anything to worry about, they're not doing anything wrong, and so they don't take any steps to secure their own security? You have walls uh, on your house and you have curtains. Why do you have curtains? Of course, privacy matters. It's a human right. Our personal privacy is at risk like never before. As governments and corporations innovate new ways to use our data, the results are increasingly affecting how we live our lives, deciding things ranging from what apartments we can rent to whether or not we end up on a government watch list. We need to begin to ask ourselves, where do we draw the line? Has the line already been crossed? 
and how far are we willing to go to save privacy as we know it.